Hello, gardeners. Thank you for joining us. This is Mid-American Gardener, and we're happy to have you here because we wanna talk about things that are going on right now in the garden. So we'll be doing that in just a moment. I'll introduce myself and everyone else, and then we'll get going. My name is Diane Nolan, and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. So I'll handle perennials questions, maybe cut flowers, landscaping, things like that. But we have three other really highly intelligent people right here who have other expertise. So we're gonna go to them, I'll introduce them and let them tell you what they have the expertise in. So I'm gonna start first with you, Randy Thornton. Hello, uh, my name is Randy Thornton. I'm associated with the University of Illinois Master Gardeners out of Vermillion County. Uh, I've worked in the landscape field and so on and so forth for quite a few years and all, but. Uh, most of my expertise would, if there is such thing, would be in uh, <laughs> perennials, landscape shrubs, uh, hardscaping, uh, just about anything uh, as far as the landscape. But uh, one thing I would like to touch on is uh, we had a question last week from a viewer that kind of, uh, none of the panel wanted to really go into too much because there were some issues with the, whether they were actually edible or not, when that was ground cherries. Well, as it turns out, many of the ground cherry fruits are edible uh, they're all a member of the group, uh, if I can get the pronunciation right, Phasalis, uh, which is actually very closely related to tomato, and uh, tomatilla is actually one of them. Uh, Chinese lantern flower is one, but not all are edible, so, and many of them grow wild in our area, so but as long, with any wild plant, make sure you know what you're uh, dealing with. Make sure that someone knowledgeable actually identifies it for you. But uh, they are used in preserves and all. They can be treated like tomatoes. They're very unusual in that they drop their uh, fruit in the husk and uh, ripen afterwards. So a little bit of touch on it, but uh, just something we weren't aware of. We were concerned about the poisonous ones. Yeah, yeah, they are a member of the nightshade family. So it's like, well, it's a tomato and peppers and so forth. But So just make sure what you're dealing with. And well, thank you, Randy. And before I, inter well, I should introduce Kent and then have him comment. <laughs> Kent Miles is in the middle and you actually have grown. Yes. Some of yeah. the Faisalist types. Yeah, we've grown it, uh, grown it for ornamental use. And it makes a wonderful uh, autumn decorative pod. Yes, very so good. So expand what your expertise okay. is and uh, go for it. My name is Kent Miles and I'm uh, the owner of Illinois Willows. We are a specialty cut flower grower uh, loaded, located in Western Champaign County. Uh, we have product year round. And now with the autumn season coming along, we're starting with uh, a lot of the uh, bittersweet. And here we uh, made a wreath of the bittersweet. And uh, when we make the, the fall wreaths with the bittersweet, uh, we use them when uh, the bittersweet's closed up and it's not showing the color. And then when it dries, it'll pop open and uh, show a lot of the beauty in the fall color. So we just constructed it on a uh, bittersweet wreath and uh, wove the buried uh, branches across the top of it and uh, makes a nice decorative holiday piece. It's gorgeous. Yeah. I'm trying to talk him into leaving it, but I don't think he <laughs> probably should. <laughs> and the other quick item I've got is um, uh, castor bean. This is somewhat of a tropical looking type of a plant. Uh, it flowers and then forms these uh, seed pods, which are similar to a sweet gum ball. And it's, uh, we can use it incorporating in fresh flower arrangements, uh, table decorations for the uh, Thanksgiving and fall season. How tall are your castor beans? Uh, we got them in late this year. Uh, right now they're about six foot. And I got mine in fairly late and I would say mine are about eight. Okay. But I bet yeah. they're gonna get I've larger. I've seen them up to about 10. Yeah, I'm thinking they're gonna go 10 with yeah. a bit more Another warm plant. weather. Uh, they should be aware is a poisonous plant yes. as well. Yes, exactly. Yeah. All parts of this are yes. poisonous if it's consumed uh, to a certain level. So just use it as a backdrop right. and no consumption, yes. no tasting of it. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you, Kent. Uh -huh. And then next to me is Dr. Phil Nixon. And what do you do, Phil? I'm an extension entomologist Excellent. with the University of Illinois, which means I do bugs. It's <laughs> uh, technical. Insects. Yes. Whatever. Uh, I have a, uh, a uh, email from a viewer from Bolingbrook, Illinois, and uh, they say that their hybrid tea roses outside are constantly plagued with Japanese beetles each year. Heard that putting down some grub X in the lawn would kill the larvae, 
when do you suggest I do this? I'd also appreciate other recommendations you might have for Japanese beetle control. And then uh, goes on to wants to know about take on Japanese beetle traps. Says some say they work, some say they just attract more to the yard. Uh, with the Japanese beetles, the uh, uh, they are you can control the the white grubs that will feed on the, on the roots of the grasses, but it's not going to make it's going to make very very little difference on how many you have on your roses or on your linden trees, your crab apples. And the reason for that is, is that every three days after the Japanese beetles come out around the latter part of June, they will, into early July, they will fly to a new host and that flight is usually a half a mile to over a mile in distance. And since they're out for about six weeks, if you add that all up, you will discover that they will move 15 miles from where they came out. So unless you have a palatial estate, which is 30 or 40 miles across, <laughs> controlling the white grubs really has very, very, very little to do with how many beetles you have on your plants. I always like to say when I'm teaching, if you plant it, they will come. And so if you have the plants that they like, like linden, crab apple, roses, they will find you and they will eat them. The, uh, and so using the grub X or some other type of a white grub material is fine if you're trying to control the white grubs in your turf. Otherwise, for the adults, you can hand pick when, they're, when, they're, when, when they first come out uh, and, uh, and that will help reduce the number because they're attracted when they move every three days to another plant that's already been fed upon by Japanese beetles. So if you can keep feeding off your, off your plants for the first couple of weeks, then they go feed on your neighbor's plants, which is what it's all about in a residential area. Let them eat your neighbors. Uh, so that's, that can use a jar with some rubbing alcohol or some soapy water. There are sprays you can put on, carbaryl, so does seven works well, pyrethroid insecticides work well, such as permethrin, so does eight insect spray. Any of that will work well. Second part of the question is, is, is do the traps work? Traps have been tested over and over and over and over again probably at least 60 or 70 times, all of the results show that if you have traps, you will have more damage than if you do not have traps because the traps will attract the Japanese beetles to the area. And before they go all the way to the trap, they test out what's there and eat it first. So the best I, way I like to say, with tongue in cheek, is to use the beetle traps, is to give them to your neighbors for Christmas, let them go over there, leave your plants alone. But in reality, they're not, not effective. But if it makes you feel better that you killed some beetles, why not? So you have something about your neighbors? Are you picking on anyone's neighbors? No, they stay away from me. I, I my see. neighbors aren't any closer than a quarter of a mile, so they know me. Okay, yeah, very good. <laughs> but it is important for people to know that. So right, very right. good, we appreciate that. Well, now let's go next to an info page, and we had a viewer send in things about, um, about moles. So let's go to that page next. <music> Okay, so we don't want to open a can of mole worms, but does that always work? No, it does not. Um, uh, we were discussing work, it before. It will work initially. Uh, vibrations in the soil will usually keep moles away for about two to three weeks. Then they adapt to it. Uh, if you stop for a while, it'll work for about a week. And then when you go again, it won't make any difference what you do. So for the, if, it, if for viewers where it works, great, feel good about it, fine. But for most people, it does not work very well for the long Moles term. Moles adapt. Yes. That's really... They're yeah. kind of like people. They get used to things. They so. adapt. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we appreciate viewers sending things in, and it may work for some people. Yeah, so. if it works for you, fine. So try it out. All right, we want to go to the phone lines next, and we're going to start with line two, and it's a question about watermelons. Hello there, line two. Hi, yes. Uh, on a whim, I planted uh, some watermelon plants. And they were doing really well, and I got a really nice big watermelon, and I picked it and cut it open, and it was horribly underripe. It was just barely beginning to turn pink, and I thought it was gone, gone by. So can you tell me how to tell when a watermelon is ripe? It should basically break loose fairly easily. 
generally next to the uh, where the watermelon attaches, mm -hmm. there will be curls, tendrils associated with a vine. When those turn brown, that's an indication it's getting close to ripening. On the underside of a watermelon, there will be a blush area. And when that light area on the underneath side of a watermelon turns whitish, that's an indication from yellowish, that's a form, idea that's ripe. And then there's also the thunking test, yeah, I was where you thunk the watermelon <laughs> yeah. and hear whether it's, whether it's hollow or not. And <laughs> if you do all of that and you figure out that you still messed up, you learn real fast because you get tired of cutting open watermelons you can't eat. But uh, it takes a little bit of practice, a little bit of skill, a little bit of, 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 of knowledge about it. But, uh, but with those three, you can usually come up pretty well. And it is heartbreaking when you do it. <laughs> not that any of us have done it here on the panel. No, but no we feel for you and that beautiful watermelon. Thank you, that was a good question. When to harvest things, it's important. All right, let's go on to line three next, and this is about white flies. Hello, line three. Hello, I have been plagued with millions of white flies from one end of my yard to the other, even in the grass. I don't like to use chemicals because my dog is real sensitive to a lot of chemicals. So I tried soap and water, which I think just irritated him. Is there something I can do, uh, maybe a lack of nutrient in the soil that makes my plants more prone to white flies? Uh, are you seeing any damage caused by them? Not really, uh -huh. everything's doing beautiful. That's right, so why do you need <laughs> to worry about them? You don't. Because I can't stand them in my face when I go out there. Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> white flies are in everybody's yard pretty much now throughout the Midwest. They build up in high numbers towards the end of the season. Bottom line is, is that it's close enough to fall where that uh, they're not really going to hurt the plants to any great extent. Uh, white flies are going to be little gnat-like white insects that when you touch the foliage or, or bush, it will, they will just kind of fog out. Uh, they are a problem earlier in the season on things such as tomatoes and, and uh, other types of vegetables and as well as flowers, but this late in the season are not a problem. If you see them earlier in the season, then insecticidal soap sprays, particularly directed to the underside of the leaves on the lower part of the plant, that's where most of the immatures are, will be effective. They are sucking insects, but at this time of the year, they are nothing more than cosmetic and it's just best to learn to live with them. They will be gone when it frosts, and then you'll wish you had the white flies along with all your plants. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about this before the show, and mm -hmm. Kent, are you, you said you were experiencing yeah, seeing the white flies. Yeah, it just seems like they're just millions this oh, yeah, year. they're everywhere. But right, right now, I've noticed some too, but they're not causing problems. No, right? not really. So just it's just- Annoying. Yes. Yeah, just annoying. Yeah. yeah. We're gardeners, we're used to annoyances. We can put up with it. Yeah, we can do it. I prefer a white fly over some of those hornet-like things oh, yeah. that I see hanging around, so. Well, very good question, and we appreciate that. And so now we're going to go on next to line four, and this time it's about a cherry. Hello, line four. Yeah, good evening. Hi. Uh, we have a weeping cherry tree. It's about six foot tall, or oh, maybe two and a half inches at the base or so. And my wife was cleaning out some uh, other flowers and stuff around there and noticed that at the base there's two spots where it looks like sap has oozed out from the tree and formed like a little clear... Uh, like a waterfall or whatever, and there seems to be a good amount of it. It's hard, it's not liquid, and we were just wondering if this is an indication that something's bored into the tree and is going to kill it, or whether it's just, uh, I couldn't see any other indication of anything nibbling or chewing on the round of, uh, the base of the tree. How, how old is your cherry tree? Uh, we've had it for three years, four years. Okay, it's a little young. <laughs> uh, Cherry trees have uh, are short-lived trees, and usually once they're in their teens to their early 20s, depending on how far north uh, you are in the state or in the, or in the Midwest, more farther north, the trees last a shorter period of time, uh, you will get cankers, bacterial, fungal cankers that will cause bleeding and what they call gummosis to come out like this. And so it's a fact, it's a sign that your tree, there's really not much in the way of treatment for it, just a sign that the tree is, is going downhill, and if you want another cherry tree, you need to be planting one in another part of your yard. Uh, in this case, uh, if that's right at the soil line, this could be peach tree borer. 
which uh, peach tree borer will, will attack and you'll get gumosis, they call it, right at the soil line and just underneath it. And in those situations, you can apply uh, a permethrin product, uh, eight insect spray or other materials can, containing permethrin. Typically, my memory serves me right, I believe it's the, uh, it's the middle of June is when you would apply that in central Illinois a couple weeks later in northern Illinois or, or a similar latitude and a couple of weeks earlier in the southern part of the Midwest. Okay, so not great news. Yeah, on a three-year-old tree, it should that's, not be doing that. That's sad. If it was 13 years old, that would be normal case Sur of things. Not surprising. Yeah. Well, thank you for that uh, question and the rough news. Someone has to give it to you because that's... <laughs> yeah. It not, still may be cankers. It yeah. could easily be cankers yeah. on a tree that young, but mm -hmm. that's not good news for the longevity of that tree. And, and the weeping the has graphs and things and which makes them tend to be a little weaker trees yes. as well. Yeah. Beautiful so. but weaker. Yeah. Okay well thank you so much. Next is our special item we call Did You Know? Great plant, Russian sage, very good. Now we'd like to do a few more viewer emails and some show and tell, so we're gonna go back to you, Randy. Okay, we got a uh, viewer email in and they were asking about what is spot compost and they are saying it was mentioned in an earlier episode and I missed the commentary. Well, I missed it as well, but I am going to have to assume what they're speaking of is a lot of folks composting makes it easier just they dig the plant material in as it's fresh near the plants and so on. Uh, there's about as many ways of composting as there are people who compost. So mm -hmm. uh, this is actually, if you have small amounts of compost material like kitchen scraps and all, this is probably not a really bad way to do it. Uh, I have seen people do it and it seems to be successful. Some people keep a deep layer and just keep it on top. So, but uh, I'm going to say that's probably what they were speaking of. Okay, yep. it's a true story about as many people as there are ways to compost. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> with the way that way with many things. That's right. Well, good. Thanks a lot. And now, Kent, what do you have to show us? Well, keeping on that fall theme. Yes. Uh, we have one of our grasses that we grow. We do uh, four different types of perennial grasses, and right now they're really showing their their beauty in the blossom. And this here would be the blossom of this particular variety. It's called Dallas Blue. And it has a bluish What's it called? Dallas blue. Dallas blue. Yeah. Beautiful. It has a bluish upright foliage. It has a greeny tone to it. And then it uh, forms the blossom. Uh, they started probably about almost three weeks ago. And they started off pink. And now they're going into uh, a little bit deeper tones. And it's great. This particular type of uh, variety of grass dries very well. It keeps the blossom open. Ooh, pretty. Uh, very little shedding. So you can use it for outdoor decorating. Uh, maybe in your entryway, uh, if your petunias and geraniums are starting to show some age, uh, just inserting a couple stems of the uh, grasses will give you that nice fall look for your entryway. So just offhand, how tall would you say? Uh, this that? is maxing out at about seven foot. Wow. And they are uh, eight-year-old plants. That's really Amazing. pretty. Nice texture. Yeah, it is. Very nice. Dallas Great. Blue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kent. Yeah. And now, Phil, another email for you? Yes, a uh, viewer writes in that uh, every year my hostas get holes in the leaves, like an insect is eating them. What should I do? One way I used to identify hosta are holes in the leaves, <laughs> <laughs> being a bug guy. Uh, most commonly, the holes in the leaves are caused by slugs, uh, sometimes by snails, which are a slug is just essentially a shell of snail. And there are two things that slugs really like in life besides hostas, and one is, is that they like a lot of moisture, and they also like dead organic matter. And typically with hostas, we grow them in shady areas with lots of moisture, and we pile the mulch around them like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> uh, if, we, if, we put the, if we get a little more dryness and a little less dead organic matter, the slugs are very much fewer. And so spacing the hosta farther apart so it's not a full solid bed, not having the organic matter means you're going to have to go in there and weed 
but you will greatly reduce the slugs naturally. If people want to know how to do things naturally, that's the natural way to reduce slugs. You may not like it, but that's the way it is. There are slug baits, particularly those that have iron phosphide are more gentle on other organisms. Most common brand name is Sluggo, S-L-U-G-G-O. There are also, if you happen to have your hostas planted next to ewes, uh, taxis, or strawberries, you're very likely to have black vine weevil come and visit and make holes similarly. And there, of course, the best way is because they feed on the roots of the, hot, of the uh, strawberries and the ewes, uh, move them away from those, and that would be your ideal thing. Otherwise, our insecticides can be used in early June. Most commonly, it's likely to be slugs. I did not realize that about ewes and strawberries. Fortunately, I have not placed mine near any of those. I so just learned that about a month ago that myself. That is so really interesting. And what, I didn't know what is it? It's the... Black vine weevil. Black vine weevil. Mm -hmm. Little be beetle about three-eighths of an inch long. Yeah, I am familiar with it, but I just didn't remember what that was. Well, very good. You learn a lot on this show. Take Feeds notes. Feeds at night. Works, works the night shift. Oh, yeah. just like Sluggo. Just like the slugs. Yeah, they work, <laughs> work the night shift, too. Mr. Sluggo. All right, well, there we have it, and we're going to go now to the phone lines, and let's start with line five, and it's a question about asparagus. Hi there. Line five, are you there? I'm not hearing line five. Oh, and I was wanting to know your question about aspar asparagus. All right, let's go to line six about a green ash. Line six. It's very... Hello? Oh, line six, are you the green ash question? Yes. Okay. What have you got? Um, I have a tree. It's an older tree. It has three main uh, branches. One of the branches, about six weeks ago, started dropping brown leaves. Um, I would say about a third of the leaves have dropped. I looked at the branch, and I don't know if it was a cicada or what. There were about 17 carcasses climbing up the branch. I don't know if that would affect it or if it has some kind of a disease. And so that was my question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the shells from the cicadas are what are colloquially called locusts. Um, the cicadas are not going to be a major problem, although the immatures, the nymphs, feed on the roots. I'm sure this situation is due to something else, which I'll I probably girdling roots or something. I'll let somebody who knows more about horticulture than me answer that. Well, uh, has there been any? Where is the tree located? Is it like in the center of the yard, near the house? What are we? Um, it's about. It's in the backyard. It gets the sun from the west. It's um, like I said. It's an older tree. It's probably just, uh, well, eleven feet from the no, house. Nothing's changed. I mean, you have it. Have you had any construction? Has anything changed with the tree or? No. Okay. Um, and it's just that one branch. Well, it was pruned. Uh, I will say that a couple of years ago, but yeah. it wasn't topped. Yeah. But it was pruned because it had branches um, that were on the roof. Well, the fact that one branch is dying, it's kind of like Phil said, that kind of indicates possibly partial root problem or maybe even that part of the uh, trunk could have been possibly damaged in one area or something like that. So. And uh, it is just the one branch, so that's good yeah. if you can prune that one out. How old is the tree or how far, what's the diameter on the trunk? And I, it, it's, it's quite old. It used to have even a child's swing. Okay. So it's four or five feet across? Um, That's an old no, ash tree. No, it's not. Okay. At the base, it's probably about uh, a yard across. Oh, okay, still a good that's size a, that's tree. A good yeah. Size yeah, tree. That's, yeah, that's, that's not unexpected then. No, I was going to say, that could just basically be aged. It could be yeah. aged and some yeah. decay. That's older than a girdling root would be a problem. It would have killed right. it well before that. Yeah. Well, that is excellent then that you've got a tree that's looking that good. And well, ashes are yeah, having and, trouble. Yeah, so I'm glad it's doing as well as it is. Well, I'm going to skip right to line four and let's have a bittersweet question. Line four. Yeah. Hello. Hi. I'm glad you got a bittersweet man on there. I've been you wondering. You know it. That's why, I'm, <laughs> that's why you're on. Yeah. I planted three plants of bittersweet about 30 years ago in the corner of the yard. And it's got big bush, or I guess it's three of them in there, but it's never had berries. And I heard lately that you do not need a male and a female to have the berries, that only one is necessary. And what can I do to get the berries off the bushes? Um, are all three of them blooming at the same time? 
I don't see, ever see them blooming. They're just a real healthy green tree. Hmm. Okay. Uh, it's a single stem or is it a multi-stem shrub? Well, it's kind of hard to tell now because they're, they're big, and, but there's three of them right there together. And they both okay. have been uh, male and female ones. But Okay. Generally, you'd, on the age of your plant, you do need the male and female. Uh, some of the newer uh, cultivars uh, generally will uh, set fruit on the female. Uh, they will bloom almost at the same time, uh, but generally you do need the male and the female to set the fruit. So find out, you may have to get one of each because you don't yes. always uh, know. And sometimes, unfortunately, things are mislabeled sometimes in, okay. in the trade. Well, we got the bittersweet question yep. in, perfect timing. I want to thank each of you for watching and you folks here, and we will see you next week. Have a great week gardening. Bye-bye.